Shalom. I'm Yoel Finkelman, curator of the Judaica Collection at the National Library of Israel. I'm Nechama Goldman Barish, a senior faculty member at the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. And today we're going to be introducing the more celebratory holidays of the Jewish month of Tishrei, the fall festivals. So Sukkot is really my favorite holiday of the year. Uh, it's a very exciting time, this idea of even going out of the house into these little huts that many people spend time decorating with pictures, with hanging fruit, with sweet smelling branches. And you sit around the table and there's something a little picnic-y like it. You sit around and you have delicious food and you invite over family and friends. And it's really a sense of thanksgiving after the solemnity of the high holidays. Definitely a change in atmosphere. And if you walk around Jerusalem neighborhoods or neighborhoods in Israel or, or Jewish neighborhoods around the world, there's certainly a changed atmosphere of people out in the streets, people building their Sukkot, uh, markets that are open to purchase the four species with people carefully examining each one to match the laws and find the most beautiful ones. Uh, and it's a change in atmosphere, even though some of the themes of Sukkot, of removal from your own secure home into something less secure, learning to trust uh, what God and nature give, they have some weight to them, but certainly after the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there's a much lighter uh, and celebratory atmosphere. Right, even looking through the schach, through the palm branches that make up the roof of these little booths and seeing the stars, seeing the sky, uh, does give a sense of the vastness of the universe and yet you're in your little secure bubble, your own, your own little secure space that is filled, hopefully for all of us, with people that we love and wanna be with. So one of the things, the way this gets expressed uh, is in, a marvelous book that I like. This is a 1601 printed edition from Venice, uh, and it's printed in Yiddish. One of the wonderful things that print enabled was the possibility of a, a larger and more diverse popular literature because texts became cheaper once they became printed. And Yiddish, which was the vernacular, it was not the the ivory tower rabbinic language of Hebrew and Aramaic. This was the spoken language explicitly for what are sometimes called women and men with the education of women. <laughs> uh, and here we have what's called a Sefer Aminagim, a book of practices which goes through the annual cycle and with wonderful little woodcuts gives you an image. And here we have an image of a woodcut of a family uh, uh, ostensibly in the sukkah uh, going out of their home. Uh, and there are men and women in fine uh, Italian Renaissance dress. Uh, and this you know, this book continues with wonderful woodcuts of other holidays that we don't have time now to talk about of Purim, the holiday at the time of dressing up, uh, or the prayers, special prayers for the new moon, uh, or the baking of matzah and Passover. But here, uh, this idea of focusing in a very popular way on the practices of the Sukkot uh, holiday uh, is really marvelous in this simple, uh, printed Yiddish book for the less educated. And can I also assume calling it Sefer Haminagim, the book of customs or practices, would be different in Germany than, say, in Morocco? In other words, in terms of the, the blessings they might have said or the foods they might have eaten and so on. That's yeah. what a custom is or a Certainly practice there is. were different traditions, but this is, of course, a Yiddish book reflecting the practices of the Yiddish-speaking community. Uh, and there was a tendency um, with printing to unify certain practices because they could be spread by print more easily. More quickly. So I really love this image from the 19th century where you see a family sitting around the sukkah and you see the chains that today people still make out of paper or out of fruit that they hang in their sukkah. And you see the young woman bringing in a steaming tureen of soup because she has to go from the house into the sukkah. So really this picture, while it's somewhat old fashioned, is still very reflective of the way um, Sukkot looks today in many homes and many communities. What I wanna talk about, Yoel, is the eighth day. We have a holiday that in the Torah, in the Bible, is mentioned as the eighth day coming at the tail end of the seventh day Thanksgiving holiday of Booth's Festival. And it's really meant to be distinct and on its own, but its entire character is made up of bringing specific sacrifices to the temple. 
Well, post temple and around, you know, several hundred years after the temple is destroyed uh, in 70 CE, the question of what to do with this eighth day besides saying special prayers um, arises and it turns into a celebration of the completion of the cycle of reading Torah, which became a fixed cycle so that every year we go through the five books of Moses uh, reading one portion a week to get us in the 52nd week back essentially to the beginning. And so Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah, becomes the character of this holiday of the eighth day. And that's where you begin to see almost ecstatic celebration. We've talked about solemnity on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then joyfulness and thanksgiving on Sukkot. And it kind of culminates in a I would say almost carnivalesque atmosphere where there's drinking, where children are running around the synagogue almost unchecked. There's more talking and ecstatic dancing and sometimes eating in places that we don't normally eat and certainly drinking and flag waving. And really this takes on a totally distinct character, different than everything that came before. Yeah, and you get special prayers uh, that involve the celebration of the Torah, the removal of all of the Torah scrolls from the Ark and dancing with them throughout the synagogue. You mentioned the place of women increasingly in recent years. There has been more and more place uh, for gender equality in these uh, celebrations, at least in some communities. And here we see a very simple manuscript on paper, uh, but there was a choice by somebody in, in roughly 1790 who loved this holiday enough to commission a calligraphic uh, set of the special prayers for Simchat Torah. Here we have a uh, carefully uh, written cover page, and then Sisu v'gilu b'simchat Torah, celebrate and rejoice right. on the holiday of Simchat Torah. The reinforcement, not just of happiness, of joyousness, but Sisu v'gilu, like rejoice and rejoice even more. And that leads to, as we mm -hmm. said, this kind of almost circular motion of frenzy, of dancing with all the Torahs, of, uh, of circling the, the, uh, the, the tables in the synagogue, like really a sense of um, of absolute joyfulness. So you mentioned in passing flags, yes. and one of the traditions of the modern period is to give children flags and they will participate in the dancing, carrying specially made flags. Uh, and we have here uh, two from uh, the collection. This is, a, uh, this is from Warsaw uh, and Vilna. This is an East European flag in the Zionist tradition, the early Zionist tradition. We see the figure along with Moses and Aaron from the Bible, but also of Theodore Herzl. Right. And on the other side, the image of the other Zionist leader, Max Nordau, and some of the prayers upon which uh, taking the Torahs out of the Ark are sung and celebrated and danced. And also look, there's the lion and the gazelle, and you'll find that on a lot of flags today that are given to children, those symbols very prominently displayed. And the question of the symbols on the flags becomes super important. And here we have another from the flag collection, a more contemporary one uh, from the reformed Jewish community of Israel, which so shows a kind of uh, men and women of different ethnicities within the Jewish community celebrating Simchat Torah with the Torah scrolls and with the flags as a kind of um, kind of cartoon drawings that show out in the fields and not only in the synagogues uh, the on the landscape of the land of Israel. So what we see here, Yoel, is something you already mentioned earlier. We see girls dancing with the Torah. And that really is, of course, a reflection of modernity of the last 100 years in which women are looking for more active participation in synagogue, where they were often behind the mechitza or the divider, very passively watching. And in most communities, um, in many Jewish communities around the world, women are given more active roles and in many cases are given the Torah with which to dance. I think what we've seen here, you know, as we come to the end, is a, really a holiday that beyond the liturgy has many rituals that make it very, very dear. And I'm talking about Sukkot and Simchat Torah, which are not just inside the synagogue praying, but very much going outside of the synagogue 
outside of the homes into these very special spaces that remind us both of our uh, vulnerability, but also our thanksgiving, our gratitude for where we are at the end of this period of time. And uh, then morphing into this you know, ecstatic celebration of our identity as a people who still care about and learn and study uh, this ancient text of ours, Torah. And that I think is a kind of perfect ending for what amounts to a very long and intense month of different kinds of celebrations with all kinds of emotions and experiences and peaks with that kind of ecstatic celebration. Nechama, thanks for coming to the National Library and giving us an excuse to discuss the holidays of Sukkot and Simchat Torah and some of the items from our collection that reflect those celebrations. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>